Hi, I'm Michelle Graham, the Technically DC Market Editor. Technically is a new site that grows local technology communities by connecting organizations and people through news, events, and services. This is Technically DC Diaries, a pilot interview series where I will talk to local technologists and startup leaders about themselves and why they do the hard and good work that they do. For this edition, I have with me Shanaz Chaudhry, Chief of Staff at Vimo Education. Thanks for joining. How are you today? Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm doing really well. I'm really happy to be here today, and I'm glad that we're getting a chance to chat. Awesome. Yes. Everybody watching, Shanaz and I have emailed a lot, and we've never actually met face-to-face -face or talked on the phone. So I'm very excited for this interview as well. Let's hop right into it. So first, tell me, how did you uh, get into working in tech slash entrepreneurship? Yeah, for sure. Um, so my journey began uh, shortly after college. Uh, I uh, went into Teach for America and I was teaching uh, fifth and seventh grade math in uh, Southeast DC and Ward 8, if anyone's familiar. Uh, and uh, my teaching career was wonderful in many ways, but I realized that um, it wasn't the right, like the right fit for me. And so uh, when I, I started talking to some of my friends and just asking about like, what are some of the like cool, interesting companies that uh, are doing incredible things and uh, I stumbled across uh, through a friend that, I, friend that I went to college with, General Assembly, uh, which was just getting started in the DC market. And I had the pleasure of joining General Assembly as I think like the fifth or sixth hire on the ground for the DC uh, campus and uh, started in admissions and then um, went into uh, sales operations and admissions management that became the regional director. And during that entire time, I had such a pleasure uh, working with our hundreds and thousands of students, uh, depending on how you look at it, uh, transition into tech and talking with employers in the area. Um, all of that was, I think, my first introduction to uh, what the DC tech scene really is and what it means to be a part of the tech community. Awesome. So let's hop into talking about your role with Vimo. What does a day in the life of a chief of staff really look like? What do you do? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, so chief of staff roles, I think very, uh, very much so from organization to organization. And I think it looks really different in the political spectrum than it does uh, in the, uh, on the corporate side. But I think that one of the things that, um, one of the universal sayings that I've heard used to describe the, the chief of staff role is that you are uh, the grease that makes the wheel go faster and you're the glue that holds us together. Um, so you're the grease and the glue um, uh, for different parts of the organization. My particular role is focused on, um, there's two chiefs of staff, the other chief of staff focuses on growth and product and I focus on everything that is not growth and product in terms of business operations, legal, finance, HR, talent, recruiting, all of those things. Uh, and I think a typical day will have a little bit of all of that, or I'll be taking a deep dive into one area of the business. Um, and my job is to remove blockers and make sure that uh, we're moving as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, and also sometimes to tackle um, the one-off things that don't really belong to anyone in terms of a specific job responsibility. And um, just, we need someone to handle, such as uh, I was responsible for all of the COVID-19 planning right at the beginning of the pandemic and making the call um, to uh, go remotely and making sure we were ready to go remotely. Uh, that's one example of uh, where it's just kind of an all hands on deck for whoever or where you just kind of take responsibility for um, the project that doesn't necessarily belong in anyone's hands. Got to. Um, I want to go back to that um, coronavirus point you just made. What was it like being a part of or actually essentially heading, making that decision to say, okay, this is real, we need to, you know, move to remote work. What was that process? What did that look like? Yeah, so the VIVA leadership team is uh, really good at kind of swarming uh, together. And so I, uh, first I did like an analysis of like what was happening. I, I think if we remember, um, now it feels like we have, we somewhat have our arms wrapped around uh, the pandemic uh, for better or for worse. But uh, six months ago or so, we we didn't really understand what was happening. All we saw were these big companies uh, like Microsoft and um, Amazon were opting to send their, their workers home. But uh, in Virginia, there hadn't been as much of a discussion. I, I think this was right at the time where the outbreak had happened in Seattle, but we didn't know about New York yet. And so, what we did is we uh, we just took a look at like what are some of the major companies doing um, and like 
would and weighed the pros and cons of, well, should we wait and see what happens or um, should we kind of plan for this in advance? And uh, I'm really proud of the way the VMO leadership team came together and ultimately said like, look, it's better to, to act early and send everyone home now um, than it is to wait and find out that we waited too long. And so uh, we made a, a conscious decision to be proactive in response to the pandemic and keeping our employees safe and healthy um, and send every sent everyone home. Uh, very cool. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, we've been remote ever since. Absolutely. Who's your Who's your friend? I just called down there. That was That was Izzy. That's my my great cat Izzy, who likes to to sit up on that windowsill behind me while I work to make sure I stay on task. <laughs> How old is Izzy? Izzy's about a year and a half old. She is. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah, I have a coworker who likes to snore, Tiger Lily, my dog. She's four and she just sleeps all the time. And I'm like, you're a bad person to work next to. So I don't oh. kick her out. Anyways. <laughs> the best lives. Yeah. Oh my God. All right. So what's great about the DC tech community and what can it do better? Ooh, um, let's see. What's great about it is that I think it's full of people who are full of so much heart and passion and hustle for uh, the broader DC tech scene. Um, whether um, you're part of the, the former Blackboard Mafia uh, that we see, uh, shout out to Shayna Glenzer and um, everyone who's a part of that crew, down to uh, the, like, the latest generation um, of tech workers that we're seeing. I think that there's just a number of people who um, believe in and want to support the tech scene. And I saw that very much so firsthand uh, while I was at General Assembly, I think that there were a ton of people out there um, making sure that in the meetup groups and in the um, and in the uh, in training and in um, all kinds of things that uh, that newcomers felt welcomed, and that's one of the things I've always always appreciated. Um, one thing that we can do better is that the question. Yeah. Ooh. Um, <laughs> let's see. I, so I, I'm biased. I live in Virginia. Gotcha. Uh, and one of the things I would love to see is the DC tech community be a little bit more inclusive of Maryland and Virginia residents. Okay, yeah, that's real. Um, so the, the DMV, I, I, uh, I think that there's, and naturally I totally get it, like DC is the center uh, really, uh, but I think that there's a number of folks who uh, live in Virginia and Maryland who are just as talented and just as hardworking and who would love to just like be a part of that community and be considered part of that community. So I want to get rid of all the bridge bias and just talk about what it means to be um, a tech person in the DMV. Absolutely. I myself, when I started at Technically um, I started at a time where Amazon was, it was still a big buzz about Amazon trying to decide where their second headquarters was going to go. So I started looking into Northern Virginia more and just, um, different areas of Virginia and, and I cover the outskirts of Maryland too. And I will say now to this day, I probably cover the outskirts of DC just as much as I cover DC because there's just so much happening in this region altogether. It's like, it's very challenging to cover it all, but I definitely agree. There's a lot of great, great stuff happening in Virginia for sure. Amazing. Okay, it's good to hear. I think that my bias uh, or my my concern is a couple years old, uh, and so it's really really good to hear that uh, that you're thinking about the broader uh, DMV. Absolutely. Cool. Um, so, how has your work life balance been since working from home? Do you love it? Do you hate it? <laughs> um. So. I think that startups in general require a different kind of work life balance. Like this is not a. <laughs> I've never seen a startup uh, where it's just a kind of clock in, clock out, everything moves really smoothly. And so um, I like to think of it more as like work-life integration versus work-life balance. Like sometimes you have to work a couple extra hours into the evening or on the weekends in order just to make sure that it gets done. And that's what it, part of what it means to be building something from the ground up versus like uh, contributing to an organization that's existed for a long time and will exist without you. Um, and so I think that COVID has, like the pandemic and working from home um, hasn't changed too much. Like my work ethic is <laughs> uh, intense uh, this entire time that I've worked at, or my entire career as I've worked in startups. Um, but I do like that the commute got a lot shorter. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, um, I, I say the same thing. I'm like, 
you know, people often ask me, like, I bet you've been reporting less since COVID hit. I'm like, no, I'm actually covering health now. Who would have thought a technology reporter? A lot of the things I'm covering, which is biotech companies, how, you know, launching this video series and just talking to people about how their work has changed through the pandemic. I think it's offered so many more, you know, just different reasons to report um, and everything right now. Yes, of course, it relates back to the pandemic. So I say, I'm feel like I'm reporting more now than I was before because I'm covering things I already was plus more topics like this. So. I definitely and there's some really interesting like health tech and health companies uh, in the DC area. One medical um, expanded, I think, to the DC area a number of years ago. City Block Health just launched, uh, I think, last week. Uh, and so there's some really interesting. Um, there, like, there's definitely a, an intermingling of health and tech. But I agree. I think that. Um, in some ways, I feel like I'm working just as hard, if not a little bit harder, because I don't have the excuse of a commute or something like that. Um, it's just, it's whatever comes up. Yes, for sure. So this is kind of great segue into my next question. I already told you I'm looking forward into sleeping in tomorrow with my crazy schedule. So what does recharging on the weekends look like for you in terms? What do you do for fun? Ooh, um, so lately I'll admit that I have a a uh, guilty pleasure of reading uh, celebrity memoirs. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> you know, I totally. I love them. I love, and I love like everything from the classics, like um, Tina Fey and uh, uh, who was the, oh uh, gosh, I'm blanking on her name, but Tina Fey's like bossy pants, yeah. fabulous Mindy Kaling's books. Um, but I most recently read uh, We're Gonna Need More Wine by Gabrielle Union. You love um, it? Was it good? It was so good. Oh, yes. <laughs> Izzy. <laughs> Izzy again. Um, uh, it was so good. It's a, such a like heartwarming um, insight into what her life was like. And um, so that was really enjoyable. I also read Retta's, uh, uh, can we curse on this? I don't know. What's the, like her, there's a curse word in her title. It's, it's so oh, close. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Retta's book, So Close to Being the yeah. Shit, Y'all Don't Even Know. Yeah. Um, and it is absolutely a joy. Um, so I've been doing things like that. I read, I, I, I recently got engaged. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. And so um, with my fiance now, getting used to using that word, uh, <laughs> we'll go to wineries that are doing good social distancing, uh, but otherwise a lot of home time. Yeah, a colleague of mine just mentioned going to a winery as well. And I'm like, am I missing out? I feel like that's the thing to do right now. It's the thing to do. You have to get out there. There are beautiful ones, um, ones that aren't too far from DC, like Stone Tower Winery is like, I think it's like an hour long drive outside of DC and it's ginormous. I think there are three major buildings. Um, so yes, definitely get out there um, and try one. If Do you like wine? Are you into wine? I love wine. Oh, I'm a red wine connoisseur. My, my guilty pleasure since COVID started as I'm addicted to a Trader Joe's wine section and I just will go <laughs> and pick up something. But um, earlier in the year, Trader Joe's was doing these like mystery bags of beer and they would put like just, you would buy the bag. It was like $6.99, $7.99, but there's like four mystery kinds of beer in it. So I indulged in that as well. But that's why I can't miss Ab Day now, beer and red wine. <laughs> They're taking over my life. But <laughs> I am with you. Uh, I am. Uh, I've also, to, to get some exercise, because I think that's one thing that has changed is I, like, I just, I never have to leave the house. So mm -hmm. I'm not walking, even the simple walk from the car or like up the hill to grab lunch, like none of that's happening. So I've been walking, my neighbor has a ginormous 100 pound Great Pyrenees. Oh my and like, she's just, it's a, it's the biggest dog I've ever seen. It feels like walking a bear. Um, <laughs> I, um, I take that, uh, her name is Amy. I take Amy on walks and runs and that's how I've been <laughs> getting some of that outdoor, um, outdoor time these days. <laughs> Not convinced Tiger to run for anything. Like when I have taken her out on runs, she's literally sat down in the middle of the street. She's like, this is not my thing, mom. Take me home. I'm like, all right, I've learned my lesson. You don't like this. She loves to walk. We can walk, we can hike, we can do all of that. But as far as running, no, absolutely not. <laughs> all right. Um, where do you hope to be in five years? You still Ooh. Think about being a chief of staff? Um, hopefully, yeah. I'm really happy. Like BMO is an amazing company. Like we've got a big, tremendous mission and uh, we're trying to help uh, help schools and help students. And I 
yeah, in five years, I hope I'm here and we're a hundred times bigger, or I hope I'm, uh, uh, if for some reason I leave BMO, I hope I'm just like at a, in five years, I want to be at a company that I love and that uh, I care deeply about in terms of their mission and where uh, we can build and um, help things grow. Absolutely. I love that. Um, what motivates you to do your work every day? Um, so I worked in education for the majority of my career, back from teaching, to working at General Assembly, to now working at BMO Education, who primarily works with um, uh, higher education schools, as well as alternative skills training providers. And I think that um, for me, uh, there's something that's deeply satisfying about working in education. I um, am a first-gen college graduate. My uh, I, my parents grew up in this area, um, but we come from a, a more of a working class family. And I think that there is something incredibly meaningful about uh, the power of education. And uh, after college, I, like every good sociology major, decided that um, I firmly believe that education is the most powerful vehicle for economic and social mobility and to be able to dedicate my career to working in education and helping um, schools get better and better at what they do or um, having the ability to impact so many lives through my time at General Assembly. Um, what gets me out of bed every morning is knowing that education has such a profound impact on um, American society and specifically social mobility and knowing that the companies that I've chosen to work for have a positive impact uh, on the world of education. Absolutely. I love that. You go, girl. I'm proud of you. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Um, I myself, like, found, like, since I've been working at Technically, like, just covering the digital divide and Ward 7 and 8 and just, like, the grocery desert, like, I've just gotten so much more into seeing how that affects, like, our you know, younger learners. And of course, when COVID hit and just seeing how different access to tech has gone to different communities, it's just been so fascinating to me. And I definitely have just delved in it more than I thought I would be interested in. But it's like, it's a domino effect. Like what affects them eventually will affect us. Like if we're not raising the next generation to be just as good as us or, or not, or even better, like are we really doing our jobs? Um, yeah. So yeah and, uh, this is um, a mission that I'm super close to uh, given um, I'll do a plug. I'm on the board of Bite Back. Uh, mm -hmm. It's focused on closing the digital divide and helping um, individuals uh, gain access to living wage careers. And uh, the digital divide isn't just about, um, I think we feel it very acutely right now with the number of folks who are um, trying to help their um, uh, K through 12 aged children uh, go to school online. Uh, but we also can't forget that the digital divide exists very much so also for our for folks in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s Absolutely. and beyond um, in terms of what it means to um, uh, be able to apply for a job. I, I can't remember the last time somebody asked me for like a paper application. I don't think I've ever had to fill out a paper application in the way that my parents' generation did. Absolutely. Um, and learning how to do that. And so I think that there's uh, one of the other things I love about the DC Tech community is there are organizations like Fight Back that are out there trying to ensure that we're able to close the digital divide and teaching those basic literature, basic digital literacy classes yeah. um, that will help um, ensure that uh, everyone has equal access to this economy and society. Yeah, absolutely. I just um, moderated a discussion the other day that Bite Back hosted, um, and it was, you know, both discussions just talked about the digital divide and just access to tech and how it affects different communities. So definitely, I cover Bite Back a lot. I, I love the work that they do. I love that it's like they simplify a lot of the things are just so complicated, like to learn in our world today. So yeah, and then I mean, people go on like when they get done with Bite Back, go on to get these big tech jobs. And I'm like, it all starts somewhere. Yeah. Um, all right, so if you could describe yourself in three words, what would they be? Ooh, um, I will say um, enthusiastic, mm -hmm. efficient, mm -hmm. and I can't decide between like effective or empathetic, but I'll put uh, empathetic. Empathetic, I like that. All right, why'd you choose empathetic? Um, I think that there is a, hmm, why did I choose empathetic? I feel like I have a huge heart and I, uh, I'm just such a, um, 
I am a sucker for all of the the sad stories that like just <laughs> hit that donate button no matter like for even like the even a, a tweet can cause me to like hit that donate <laughs> button and so I I I deeply um empathize with the with a lot of things uh, probably most peculiar probably most specifically right now I deeply empathize with the struggle of what it means to um to climb um, in social mo mobility and like how hard uh, it really is to be working class in America. And I think that um, empathy as a skill not only makes me just like a good human, but also makes me particularly good um, in the work that we do, whether, um, or the work that I do, whether it's with Right Back or in the context of um, uh, right now, we're hiring for a few roles at um, emo and I I see all of these incredibly talented people who are looking for work and um, I'm so empathetic to like just how hard it is to to get your foot in the door somewhere and um, yeah I think that that's I think about empathy a lot and uh, I think that my empathy definitely drives the way that I choose to interact with the world. Absolutely I love that all right last question any last words any plugs upcoming events you just mentioned Vimo hiring um, yeah. anything else? Uh, Vimo's hiring for a compliance uh, person as well as a business analyst. And so uh, if you want to work for a company that's helping to shape the future of education, would love to talk with you. Uh, and then separately, I just want to give a shout out to you. I'm, I'm so grateful for this series and uh, the Technically uh, Diaries. I think are just it's a super cool initiative and uh, I can't wait to, to hear more. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, I actually just nailed down my last few interviews um, for this first season, which I specifically wanted to talk to people that we featured on our technically um, Realist Connectors list, which you were on. So yeah, I'm excited to wrap up this first season and I'm hoping to do some major pushes and just get some feedback about what people thought about the show um, to make it better. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Amazing, absolutely. All right. Thank you everyone for watching. This has been Technically DC Diaries. I'm Michelle Graham. Thanks for watching and listening.